Hello, uh, my name is Gary DeCarlis and I'm your host for Celebrate Life. Uh, this is a television program that's dedicated to humanity, the wonderful lives we all lead. I'm a strong believer that everyone has a story to tell um, from all walks of life. And I try to make this program um, kind of a little microcosm of life as it is in Vermont, in the country, in the world. And um, so um, if you're interested in being on the show, please write me at celebratelife0747 at gmail.com. Or if you have a question for the guest after the show, again, write me at celebratelife0747 at gmail.com. Today, I'm honored to have as our guest, uh, Hamant Chasing, and um, he, uh, comes to us from the country of Bhutan, and we're thrilled to have him here today. And uh, welcome to the show, Haman. Thank you, Gary, for inviting. Absolutely. So share with us your beautiful life. Um, and you can start wherever you'd like, as a, maybe as a child, and bring us forward. But uh, we look forward to hearing from you, and I'm sure I'll have many questions to ask. Thanks. Uh, I will go um, in sequence. Uh... Um, I was born in Bhutan, and uh, I lived there for about 17 and a half years uh, in the country. Um, it was a time that I need to get my citizenship at 18, but uh, due to, you know, the turmoil in the country, um, the voice for democracy and human rights that our folks uh, from Nepali uh, speaking people from Bhutan uh, raised the voice against the you know, not against, but appealing the then the king uh, that did that didn't sound really well, and then that became one of the main causes for eviction from the country. So then I went to um, um, the refugee camp in Nepal. Uh, I stayed for eighteen years. Um, been there, the life was always topsy turvy. Uh, there is always a dead end for everything you do. Uh, and everyone knows being as refugees means you are poor and you are without a country. So mm -hmm. being only poor is a different thing, but there is another layer about being without a state. So mm -hmm. I was very fortunate that the U.S. Uh, government has uh, offered us, offered me and my families and thousands of other families uh, through U.S. Refugee Resettlement Program that led me to land in Burlington, Vermont, uh, in 2011. Since then, I've been living in Burlington. I love this, um, this this state, this part of the country, just because because it resonates so much uh, with the mountains that I live. I grew up uh, in my yes. childhood. Yes, yes. Those green mountains, you know, in the summer, and then the added beauty in the fall had really attracted me to stay in this country, uh, in this part of the country. The rivers, the bird chirping in summer, you know, when I go a lot of hiking, uh, those are the ones that really uh, pull me and that the, the inner self always asks me, you know, stay in Vermont because uh -huh. it, it, brings the, it, it brings the memory that uh, you have spent as a child in my country. Yes. So and now a lot of, a, citizen. A lot of times um, people new to Vermont from other parts of the world have come from from warm climates, Africa, Southeast Asia, and they're like, yike, this is a whole nother world. But it sounds like for you, coming from Bhutan and Nepal, that this is very familiar, the colder weather, the mountains, the, um, so that's, that's, that's great to hear. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Um, yeah, the, the place where I was born was in the foothills of Himalayas, which is subtropical climate. Uh, it's very hot in summer. Cool, okay. cool and dry winter, but it's not so cold as Vermont. But as you go to, because our our low temperature is because of elevations, um, yes. and then as you go higher, it is very cold. Uh, but in Vermont, it's about uh, I think it's about the latitudes that determines the temperature. That's right. So that's the only difference here. Yeah. Gotcha. So now, so tell me, Haman, at you were seventeen and a half when you left Bhutan. And it, it sounds like part of the reason that you needed to leave 
was that you were outspoken for democracy, for having people have the right to say what they needed to say, do it, you know, to live a life fully. How that's a very young age to have that much understanding of the world around you. How did you get to that place? Actually, as uh, you know, six, uh, 17 years, 16 years, uh, you know, a teen has no knowledge about the politics. And then, you know, it's a Britain is a hermit country. You know, people didn't know, people are not aware about political process, about politics, because you are under the king and mm-hmm. you are brought up to be submissive and be obedient to the laws that are, law and policies that are, you know, devised by the country. It just came up because when you see that things are not going the right way, you know, you see that there is no equal treatment. You know, there is always a voice, wherever, you know, what, what kind of country that you live in, like whether a highly democratic country or maybe a secluded, you know, suppressive country, you know, voice is voice. People want, uh, you know, uh, who wants freedom for themselves. You know, they want, they want to be what they want to be. So I think that's the cause. And, you know, as, as a teenager, I, I participated in a peaceful rally, mm-hmm. uh, which I know now is a democratic rights of any people in a democratic country. But then, mm-hmm. in my country, with a peaceful rally, it's not accepted. You know, mm-hmm. you cannot raise the voice. You know, just just think about when you like to say something, you don't have a space to tell. You know, why do you say that? It will brush up someday. But right. that was immediate cause of a uh, lot of evictions in the country, and there are yeah. other causes because. There are always, always various multiverse causes for evicting the country. No one wished to come out of the country where right. they have a friends. You know, as a teenager, I had a friends back yeah. in the country. I feel, I feel very heavy hearted. I didn't, I didn't care about my citizens or other kind of like properties or other. But the greatest thing that I was really uh, affected was I'm losing. I'm disconnecting with my friends at that point. Right, as right. A as, as a teenager, those are everything, your friends. Yeah. Yes. Did they did they leave as well at some point, or do they are they still there? Um, most of them stayed back in the country, um, and some of them came along, you know, with me in the refugee camps with their families. Um, yeah. It's all divided. The whole Nepali ethnic community. The generation of the communities uh, were all divided. So we have some relatives back in the country, and we have some here. Mm-hmm. We are all divided for all this. But you know, the the sad part of the story is since we were evicted uh, 32 years ago, none of the single Britannies were entertained to go back to the country, even as a mm. U.S. citizen, even as a U.S. citizen. Wow. On one part, what I see on is, I see my life meaningful by, you know, listing out you know, the positive aspect of what I did throughout my life, you know, being as a citizen of this country, yeah. that is the greatest joy I had. Um, it's funny to tell you, Gary, like, I was born in my country, and that was the age I was not eligible to get my citizenship. You know, you need to be 18. Oh, and then, interesting. Then I went to refugee camps and lived another 18 years. And then, you know, you were stateless. The first country I ever got my citizen is the United States of America. Wow. I'm an organic citizen of this country. I'm, I was born there. You know, I'm not, it looks like I'm, I went to the naturalization process. But I didn't have a document that I I belong to that country. That's I didn't have a citizenship of the country. Interesting. So you're not if you're from Bhutan, you're not a citizen until you're 18. Yep, you have to apply for and it. And you le- and you left at 17 and a half. Correct. Wow, that's amazing. <laughs> well, it is. And it when is. did you become a citizen here? What? what how recent um, was that? It was in the spring of 2017. Okay. And that was the greatest day in my life. I can't believe that I'm becoming citizen of this great country. You know, I'm becoming citizen of not just, you know, unknown country in the world. It's number one country in the world and I'm the citizen. You know, I'm empowered. Exactly. I'm empowered to, 
being as a citizen of this country that has brought me a lot of confidence in myself now mm. i can probably say with that and when it comes to patriotism and love towards this country i think the patriotism and loyalty to the country does not for me uh, what i feel it does not um or cannot be measured just by you know how many years that a person spent here you know right but how much how much service have you given to the community to this nation i think that counts so exactly any other regular you know patriotic americans i think if you measure that level of patriotism i have a strong sense of that because i never had a country before yeah that's oh, amazing yeah. and you know we are a great country in part hamant because you're here and you're part of it and that's what makes us great is we're a very diverse country and an accepting country and i'm just thrilled to to know that you're a united states citizen thank you I'll, gary for inviting tell me about your family where are, do you mom and dad and you have any brothers and sisters where are they oh uh, as a us resettlement program we come as a family um, okay. they don't want to divide i think that's the beauty of uh, us uh, refugee resettlement program uh, we all came as a family uh, we were originally the family of five when we came out from bhutan and then went to refugee camps and uh, i have two siblings younger siblings one brother and a sister um and uh, both parents we lived there together and got married um and then uh, i have three boys who are here uh my brother has two uh children boy and a girl and my sister is married she had a son in the process of being refugees you know i i lost my mother in 2008 she applied yeah she applied for refugee resettlement program to come to the us so while well in the process uh, she couldn't make that up uh, she got sick and you know had to leave the family the other incidents in the life that we had was uh, my brother passed away in 2019 in uh, in vermont mm. um, with the sickness um that was a sad part of the story but the good part of the story as i said you know you count the positive aspect of the life sure. and that's that's what uh, it makes meaningful you know moving forward you know we have uh, we have sons uh, we have younger generation of uh, my families in it so those are the happiness that makes me move forward although the past was you know uh, we honor the past but uh we are making up some hopeful future ensuring the future for our kids well, that's wonderful you're very, you're an optimist i can tell <laughs> and, and it sounds like your your dad is here as My well yeah. yeah oh that's great and um so what what are you doing what what kind of work do you do come on um yeah i work as a educational counselor at uh, vsac oh wonderful for the last two years and before that i was working at burlington school district for around 8 years mm-hmm. um, i was a former i was a former teacher back in uh, refugee camps and wow. then, uh, it was an accident i sh- i should say because as a young person going to refugee camps you know you have a lot of dreams but the dreams cannot be fulfilled because of the situation as a refugees yes. you know finance was the main factor for for the refugees for that because all refugees are poor and then right. it's not um possible for the parents to afford higher education right. but somehow i i went through that but when when i come back to being as a teacher um you know when we went to refugee camps um in early 90s for my family in 1992 there are lots of people together in the same small area and there were a lot of children without the schools so i did uh, my um, you know the sophomore year and then uh, they call it school living certificate you have to do the board examinations and then you get into uh, you pass through that at, you know the board exam and go for higher um, um, education for that yeah. uh, with the 10th grade after i graduated um i have to be a teacher because there are a lot of kids and you know there were no teachers because mm. all of all the people were not educated we come from the agrarian society 
And yep. people know about, uh, you know, cultivation and raiding the cattle. Just imagine mm. about, you know, the rural Himalayas. If you have been to Nepal, it's the same belt going towards the east in Bhutan. Our rural is really rural. You know, Vermont is a rural state, but for us, it's a it's a 21st century city. You know, you have all the <laughs> internet, the TV, everything else. You know, there is no less as yeah. compared to New York or you know Los Angeles. You know, we have our own beauty in it. But yeah. our rural area is so rural that one house sometimes be about four or five, you know, hours distance. Wow. So we we come from that. Uh, uh, from that perspective, from that areas. Yeah. So coming back to education, you know, you can imagine that, you know, people living in the remotest part where uh, they are struggling for the livings can think for education because education is not primary, you know, uh, in those people. That's not a priority. The priority okay. is survival. Yeah. yeah. So I became a teacher at a very young age. <laughs> And then that's how I got involved in teaching. And then I became a vice principal. Wow. And I have an education degree from, uh, I, I did my doctorate from University of Vermont on educational leadership. Really? You have a PhD from uh, in educational leadership? Or it's an uh, EDD? EDD, yeah. EDD. Doctor of education, yeah. So, oh my goodness. So from a agrarian culture, where farming and living off the land was the way of life there. You moved to refugee camps, saw a need for teaching of children who had no no, no formal education. And how and tell me how you got into the world of education. And my goodness, you've gone all the way up to the top of the ladder. Um it was a need in the refugee camps. That was a need, and I just jump in to help the younger kids. Okay, you know, so at I mean, least yeah. not as exactly a teacher, but sort of like a caretaker for the kids. Sure. But as as I started, it was very. I started as a low key, and then and I got really attached with the kids. You know, uh, emotionally attached because sure. they have been deprived from their country, and then they don't have the basic needs to live for themselves. And I feel that, you know, as a as a member of that particular refugee community, yeah. I felt it is my responsibilities because I know a little bit about, you know, education, about certain subjects. So I just jump in and, you know, I talked with them, played with them, eat together with them. It was sort of like a small family. And then I really got, you know, um, um, attached with uh, being as a teacher. Since mm -hmm. then, uh, I started in 1994. Uh, since then, somehow or others, uh, you know, I was involved or I've been involved in educations. Today, wow. I work I work at VSAC and I re, uh, I meet some of the high school seniors and you know adult students from yeah. different parts of the world, from uh, from United States, you know, coming and looking themselves that you know they see their futures to education or trainings. Yes. Wow. So, Amazing. My goodness. How many languages do you know, Amat? Um, I know a few lang languages. Uh, one is uh, Nepali. That's my ethnic language. And my tribal language is Tamang. I know a little bit about it. Mm -hmm. uh, Regional-wise, India has a lot of influence in South Asia. So my country is a neighboring country to India. Mm -hmm. And uh, Hindi is another language that I know. Mm -hmm. uh, national language... Uh, of my country, I know a little bit about it. And that is a dialect called Bengali. Uh, I know a little bit about it because I went uh, uh, to India for higher education. So I was lucky enough, um, if I see with my peers that I got a scholarship to go to India um, and then wow. had some higher education. So, wow. and wow. I want to add one thing, Gary, I think, uh, uh, to become me as today, uh, the Jesuit fathers mm -hmm. um, um, are are the ones who had really contributed to towards my personality development because I I went to through their colleges uh, I I work with them as a yeah. as an educator as a vice principal or assistant principal uh, you know 
Later in my refugee life, I went to the capital city of Nepal, in uh, Kathmandu. Mm -hmm. I worked there as as an assistant principal to one of the top schools in Nepal. Hmm. Wow! Before I came to the U.S. Yeah. My goodness. So, do you, is there some and with the Jesuit uh, priest? Is there someone in particular that saw something in you that? that they wanted to make sure that got nourished and grew? Yeah, there are some miracles that I have in my life. I don't know how people perceive me. Uh, sometimes I see that they really, really see me what I am today with all those five words that I have shared with you, simple, kind, compassion, self-motivated, caring, and helpful. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I I went from refugee camps to, you know, you know number one, you know, schools in Nepal as a refugees. I had enough educations to qualify being as a teacher, as an educator, and also as an assistant principal. But one thing was always behind me was, you know, my thinking on the back, you know, having that low self-esteem, being as a as a as an educator for non-refugees, you know, or mm -hmm. citizen of that particular country, you know. Yeah. And as as a person, as a teacher, without a country, you know, makes a lot of difference. So education actually was a breach to make yourself who you are and, you know, bring that up yourself to challenge uh, in those course of time. So the miracles and sort of, I was lucky in a way that, you know, I was promoted to as an assistant principal after working, after serving there for one year. Um, what makes me so, uh, so, uh, uh, amazing and so surprised was there were a lot of teachers who have been working there for you know 20 years 25 years who know who knew the school much better than I did because I was there for one year mm -hmm. and I have to take this challenge to you know become the assistant principal and then there were kids students for 1900 kids in the school about 100 staff and you know the next year on you are a you are in charge of like looking for the welfare of all those staffs and and the students. Um, I took the challenge because, you know, as a refugee is living in all scarcity, you know, mm -hmm. with the minimum limited uh, resources that I had, you know, I think I learned that I should cope up with different environment and also learn that with the limited skills that you have, you can make a maximum uh, outcomes with that. Mm -hmm. I think more of that is my humanity and uh, my networking and relationship with different kind of people that I live with. Mm. I think make me successful with that. Mm. And the other thing also, like coming to the U.S., um, um, you know, the Flynn Elementary School is one of the best schools in the Burlington School District. As I came in, uh, you know, I was attracted to us educational education sector. I didn't want to go work anywhere else because that's my comfort zone. Right. Um, you know, a week ago I went and met uh, with uh, Mr. Clark, then the principal at the Flynn Elementary School. Uh, there was no space, there was no vacancy at the school, and I came back and waited. You know, I, I I've not known what I would be, what my next step would be. I was staying home with my family. Um, after a week, there was a white man and you know, outside the door, and then my family was so scared because there's a white man coming here for some reason, you know. <laughs> so, and then I saw, and I saw, I vividly remember who that man was, but I was not sure who that white man was. So, as he came to our living room and then sat together in our couch, then he offered me the job. Then I was really surprised, you know. This is the second time I've been so lucky that. I've been getting this job um, to, um, you know, work in, in this great country, in the school district. And the third was, uh, you know, as soon as I graduated from UBM, um, I did, I defended my dissertation, but I was not graduated, was supposed to graduate in December uh, uh, 2019, just before the pandemic. And mm -hmm. then uh, my current supervisor went on finding out someone from education department and met with my advisor, Professor Cynthia Reyes, uh, who is also my mentor. Um, I think I'm very lucky to have her as my mentor as well. So through her, uh, the current supervisor was trying to meet with that. So that happens to be, you know, my 
appointment actually happens to be at Starbucks. Starbucks, you know, <laughs> I got a job at Starbucks <laughs> and right. to work in uh, BSEC. So there were some instances that I'm really happy with that. I feel, I feel myself like. You know, when you put yourself, when you believe, truly believe yourself in what you're doing, being as simple and compassionate, you know, people will just find out who you are and what, what kind of people they want to. Mm. So, yeah, those yeah. are some of the skeletons of how I went through. Wow. I, I, amazing. So can you take us back to those days in the refugee camps and give us a sense of what life was like there? Oh, <laughs> Uh, the first year I went to was in the fall of 20, uh, sorry, 1992. Um, you went there and you got a small plot of lands in which you are going to build a hut. Um, and we were, first of all, grouped about, you know, about half a kilometer, you know, half a mile away from where I was assigned to make my house, you know, the hut. And... Uh, the first challenge was carrying the bamboos. You know, the bamboos are really long, you know, right. long right. plants, you know. Yes. And you carry on that with, and, you know, we were resettled in a place where it was a plantation before. And then there were a lot of roots on the, on the, on the ground. And then you hit so many times and you plugged out so many nails from your, you know, <laughs> toes, you know. <laughs> there were stances like that. And then we built a house, um, that particular uh, fall, there was a heavy downpour. If you have been to South Asia, we call it monsoon. Yes. Monsoon is so terrific. You know, it comes yes. like, a, like we call a sort of like a hurricane, you know, it winds yeah. in, in a heavy downpour. And then we are, my family was given a plot and we just put on the bamboos as a, you know, support wow. to build up the house, the hut. And we got a tarpaulin to cover up uh, the roof. And one of the nights, um, there was a heavy downpour with the heavy winds. Mm. And my dad, my brother, and me were holding the edges of the plastic towards the direction, so we oh can my add, God. we can we can save our belongings getting wet. Yep. So that was the first challenge I had, and I was thinking, oh. How long I'm going to stay in the refugee camps? <laughs> That's one. And also in the initial period in 1992-93, I've seen that a lot of dead bodies were carried out towards the riverside for cremations yeah. because we didn't have we didn't have the uh, basic uh, because we are all new and also there were so many people compact in a small area. Um, change of climatic conditions or lack of uh, medications proper yeah. preventive cares a lot of people died with, uh, in the initial part of the mm. camps mm. later we came to know each other although we came from the same country we didn't know each other who the neighbor was you know, or where and then as we went on then you know you see beauty within itself you know, uh, because you see the other refugees as you yeah. Uh, there is no rich and poor. Everyone is going through the same process, uh, same right. thinking, you know, the victims of the same um, regime. So all that makes us together. And then there are some later, uh, we have uh, health centers, the people, uh, the, the disease um, were controlled. And then there were a lot of schools that were established and there were teachers. And uh, every time like, I happened to be a teacher, there were numerous number, like thousands of other teachers that were um, graduated. And thousands and thousands of students uh, passed out, and uh, that's how it went. And you have the friends and the refugees, and uh, now you are dealing with another set of friends. Yes. You know, now, by then, you are gradually forgetting your memories back right. in the country because you have adopted to a new land. Yes. With a new set of friends. Wow. Uh, yeah. That way, we got involved. I was involved in karate. Um, yeah. So the karate I learned, you know, 32 years ago, I'm practicing now. Wow, amazing! So I, I now have 17 kids that I teach uh, karate. Really? really? Uh, at a core, you know the, you know the AALB building. Yep. Uh, yeah, I yep. do that karate for kids. So it's a second uh, generation of karate. 
we, we do. Fantastic. And then currently I'm the national uh, uh, karate referee that I go uh, under the United States Karate Federations. And in the meantime, uh, what I did in refugee camp was soccer. You know, I played soccer and I refereed soccer. Mm -hmm. And currently, I'm the USSF soccer uh, referee as well. I'm doing that since My I came into the United States. Wow. So, so what I'm doing was whatever I did in the past um, in refugee camps, especially the memories and experience in refugee yes. camps, I'm trying to activate here. Um, I'm bringing that back uh, to, um, yes. to the current life and then try to... Um, present that to my, um, you know, mm. sons and mm. the younger generation from the community. Mm. So you're taking all the the good that came from a very tough time and and using it now with uh, your family, your friends and kids that are in the in the neighborhood. Correct. Right. Wow. I think um, being as refugees there, I think it was not really a good experience for anyone else who goes to refugee camp. It's not a good experience. It's not a good place. Right. But that makes the life so meaningful. That makes you learn what the life looks like being as a poor, being as without a country. You know, you become more human by being the part of that kind of life. So whenever I see, I resonate myself, you know, uh, people living in poverty, uh, that makes me emotional. That brings me together with, mm -hmm. you know, I think I should jump in for for the cause of uh, those who are in need, you know, because I went through that. I just mm. I just don't want to forget that I had it, and I don't want to remember that. But there are thousands of millions and billions of people who are uh, living under the poverty, yeah. or 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 maybe having the emotional distress. You know? Yes, like, like I went through. How can I be? I was. I'm constantly thinking about how can I be of help. And how can I be a good listener? How can I be kind enough to make sure at least I can give a hope? Yes. That's what I'm doing it. Yes. It sounds like that experience shaped your purpose in life. It's to help other people who are in a similar situation today, whether they're here or other parts of the world. Correct. Yeah. Wow. Impressive. So... Is there anything else you would like to tell us about yourself, your family, life? Um, <clears throat> about the dreams for myself, you know, hmm. I feel that um, I fulfilled my dream of being, you know, getting a degree that I had. And the work I'm doing at the BISAC, you know, are the kind of thing that um, as a part of my dream. But the, the greater dream I'm seeing is through through the achievements of my uh, my boys, three of my boys. Uh, one of them is a UVM senior. Uh, the two of them are still at, at the elementary school. Oh. So uh, that's what I see as a part of my dream. As a community, um, as a community leader and a community of uh, goodness refugees, I want to see that this community really flourish, or really uh, develop well. And well integrated, uh, and become um, uh, a well integrated towards uh, to the American society, and be a contributor for these great nations. You know, help help the nations to be strong and better. Mm. Um, I'm thankful for those who have fought, who have preserved this country and make it as number one in the world. Uh, mm. I I look forward that my community will add up uh, some more strength to this country and become and continue to remain as top one country in the world with compassion, uh, with a kindness and caring country. Yeah. Um, all through this process that I went from my being as a you know citizen of the country and being stateless and being as a citizen of these great nations, the life has been uphill and up and down. Over the time, what I learned is, you know, family is so important. Mm -hmm. You may not you may not need to have a country, but if you have a family very strong by your side, always mm -hmm. standing for you, I think that's where the life makes so meaningful. Mm -hmm. And then I learn other lesson is when you become a refugee, you must learn to adjust. And you should 
fit into the system, not break the system which is already working. So I always feel that, you know, somebody had done the great jobs to make that thing work. So mm -hmm. you are in this country, you are going to put an oil and polish that, which is already working, but mm -hmm. don't try to change everything what has been working for majority of the people. Mm -hmm. um, the third thing I know about is, you know, education is so important for anyone else. Um, for, uh, for refugees, it's so important because you don't have a uh, you don't have property, uh, you don't have a country, and you don't have um, you know enough wealth or no uh, you have no wealth about your own. But the most important thing that carry on your is education. Uh, much of this relate to myself because as a refugee, I didn't have enough money, my properties, but I was fortunate enough to have my higher educations. Yes. Um, I had my degrees back from India, from Nepal, before yeah. I came to the US. I think because of those, um, I had some license to go forward, you know, challenge myself mm -hmm. uh, to get the American degrees. Mm -hmm. So I went through, I, I got it because I felt that the time when I was in refugee camp, I had so much interest to do so many things. I had that, you know, aptitudes, aptitudes and attitudes to, achieved so much, but I didn't have my, my, because I was dealing with the, my own survival, then yeah, right. my parents could not afford with that. So I felt, you know, education has brought me up to this place. You know, it let me connect with so many people. It let me, make me happy. Uh, it made me um, a good, good father to parent my, uh, my, my sons. And my community members, you know. So, so I think that's very powerful. That yes, is, is you know, so important. You said two key words: aptitude and attitude <clears throat> got you far. And then adding, you know, having the aptitude and the attitude allowed you to kind of still have optimism when things were pretty tough. I mean the. Sounds like the refugee camps were survival mode at, at best. Yeah. Gary, I think one funny thing is after I, ha I have my degrees uh, uh, in my educational leaderships, um, I thought of what, what am I left with? You know, because yesterday I was living in poverty. What did I miss the most? You know, I was thinking all about, you know, mm. going to going to like karate, going to soccer back here in the US. Make me think about I'm recalling now what did I miss when I was a teen? I was a young man. You know, I'm recalling that. So lately, because my mother was a nurse for over 40 years, she was a nurse in Bhutan, and then she came back to refugee camps and she served a lot of refugees until you know, the last day that she got sick and she passed away. And then I thought about, you know, my mother did so much for for um, the, for the people around her. And she made a change. She was a change agent and people still remember in the community. And I thought, you know, I'm the son of that great mother, you know, right. uh, dedicated mother towards uh, the sons, uh, towards the children, and towards the community members. And I thought, Okay, I should. What should I do to make the legacy continue? Then lately, since I'm not doing, I'm just doing work at the BSAC. I was thinking, okay, uh, to carry on the legacy of my mom, I want to become a nurse. Hmm. So at 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 the current uh, time, I'm taking two pre prerequisite nursing classes, okay. just to remember and uh, honor my uh, honor the legacy of my mother. So that's what I'm doing now. What a wonderful thing. My goodness. And so you're not, you, you keep growing and you keep becoming all that you are, it sounds like. And you're reaching back and pulling forward. Trying my best. <laughs> yeah, you're doing an amazing thing. What what major is your son at UVM? What, what is he studying? Um, he's studying uh, biomedical engineering. Biomedical so, engineering, wow. He's a senior. Um, at the UBM. Um, hopefully, uh, he's planning to go to medical school someday. 
Sounds like um, but I can guarantee you that with uh, the teens, you know, it keeps on changing. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Of course. Does he play soccer like his dad? Uh, unfortunately, uh, he's a captain for the ultimate at the UVM currently. <laughs> He didn't okay. go for soccer. He tried for basketball while he was in high school. Mm -hmm. But in the college, uh, he's doing ultimate. Um, and he's a, he's a captain currently. Wow, that's fantastic. Good for him. Good for him. Well, um, what an amazing life. My uh, colleague, Ann Lezak, had referred me to you. And I can see now why. <laughs> um, <laughs> is there anything anything you want to say that we haven't talked about so far um, something about dedicating uh, who I am was you know primarily my mother and uh, you know later uh, my academic professor Professor Cynthia Reyes uh, I think uh, she is uh, She's the department head in one of the uh, education section at uh, UVM Medical, uh, sorry, uh, University of Vermont. Mm. And the great people that I came through in the US, um, you know, pretty much same uh, because we are all human. We live in a human society. It's all the same, but uh, there are some cultural differences with that. You know, people come with so much uh, knowledge uh, from out. The refugee people come in here with certain life experiences, more than their academics or formal educations like a lot of Americans have, but they have the real hands-on uh, experience in their life. Uh, what I personally feel now, although I have a degrees, but I personally feel that you know the life that I've gone through had taught me more than the degree that I went there for some years. Absolutely, yes. The so, people you're talking about have a PhD in life. Yes. Yes, and that's probably worth a whole lot more uh, in many ways than a degree in school. Yeah, true. Yes. Um, other thing that I want to talk about for young people or the American is, you know, it's a great country. You have a lot of support system in this country. You know, you want, if you want to become anything else, I think you can become, you can make a dream come true in this country. That's why you call the American dreams. You know? mm -hmm. When I came in here and being as refugees, I can see so much opportunities uh, in this country that I can grab. If I was too young um, or if I was young to, to come to this country, I would have been in a, another place, a whole lot of another place. You know. okay. In 1992, in spite of going to refugee camp in Nepal, if I happened to be in the United States at that time, then I could have done so much better. Um, I'm happy with what I'm doing here, yeah. but you know the aspirations if you talk about self-motivation and aspiration I had when I went to refugee camps and now as a young man then, I have the same aspirations, same motivations to do with that. Mm -hmm. I've never lost because um, I, I'm physically fit. I can, I can run, um, you know, a few miles. You know, I can do running and walking and hiking. Uh, I do a lot of winter hikings uh, in Vermont. We went to Adirondacks uh, oh, in summer. Yeah. And we went all the surrounding mountains um, in the Sto area and then to the Northeast Kingdom, you know, all these mountains. We did both, uh, you know, all seasons, mm. um, hikings. Fantastic. Um, so what I'm coming, coming back to the point is, uh, you know, in spite of complaining for certain things, you know, there are certain things that you can fix because you have that ability. Uh, you have that uh, resources in, in the area, in this country, mm -hmm. you know, uh, try yourself, you know, you can always define every time that you go through, you know, because you have a lot of resources, you have a lot of system, you have responsible government yes. Yes. in the place. So, and other thing that I knew was, as a refugee was, you know, you, you have to adapt to the situation. The situation won't adapt with you, you know, like fitting into the system, the system mm -hmm. will not actually mm -hmm. make a fit for you. You, know, you have to fit yourself. You have to shape yourself, you know, and then policy yourself to fit in the system. This is because when I was a uh, when I was a um, you know citizen of the country, you know, not citizen in a way that I didn't have a 
right. passport, but I was born in Bhutan. And then I went to refugee camp. My family and a lot of other family had to adjust ourselves. We have to set back and adjust to the refugee lives. Then we stayed there for 18 years. We survived. Then uh, we came to the uh, United States. It's another, another world for us. And then we stayed back a bit and then mm -hmm. moved forward. And then we adjusted ourselves or in the process of adjusting, in the transitions, you know, we are adjusting. Yes. So all this has uh, made me, you know, think about is if you have a good families uh, on your side, um, I think you can live in Antarctica, you know, with yeah. whatever yeah. you have, because you need the love and support uh, to each other. You know? So that, Yes, that's a wonderful message to give. Families first, and with a with the support of a family, you can do anything. Correct, and that that makes perfect sense. Absolutely. Well, and tell me about your wife a little bit. Where did you meet your wife? Oh, that's an interesting story. <clears throat> so, we met in the refugee camps. We went to the same schools uh, in uh, one of the refugee high school in uh, 1992, 1993. Um, the schools were funny. Um, in a way that you know the school buildings were under constructions. My first school in uh, in refugee camp was under the tree, and uh, there were huge uh, like rocks which were just laid under the trees for the constructions. Yeah. Those are those are my tables and chairs, and <laughs> and uh, you know with the uh, in that locations. Um, in South Asia, I I already talked about uh, you know the rain, the monsoon, yeah. and the heat of the sun is is, is so intense. Yeah, you can't stay for long, you know. So you need the shades. Yeah. So as you see it in the classroom under the tree, you know the earth moves, and then after a few minutes, you are under the sun, and then you find the shades. So it's like uh, mobile classrooms, you know, around the trees. Around the tree. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, I met, uh, well, I was attending my um, school in the refugee camps with my um, with my spouse. Um, mm -hmm. I've never met her back in the country. She was from a different part of uh, Bhutan. I was mm -hmm. from a different part. So we met each other and then we married uh, in 1992. Nice, very nice. That's sure. great. great. And she enjoying living here too as well? Uh, she has a different experience um, um, sitting. Uh, she has some educations, but not so much as uh, I did um, because she preferred to look after the kids and give a, you know, um, give a, you know, a valuable parenting to our boys. Yep. And then um, she has a different perceptions being in this country may not be so much in in respect to motivations, in respect to uh, the dreams that she had, you know, so the dreams comes true, and it becomes it it becomes more more and more resonating only if you see or if you experience that particular life as being, you know, uh, having some educations, you know, that you go through. So, yeah, but she has been a very uh, important part of the families for the development uh, of the of the families and the. Uh, uh, the meaningful growth of our our boys in the families. Yeah. So yeah. more than me, she had a lot of contributions to the families. That's wonderful. That's great. Well, so we're just about at the end of our interview. Is there anything, final words you'd like to say? No. Um, being to this country, I'm so proud. I'm repeating that again because I want to tell it again. I want to tell it, repeat it again. And I talk to a lot of people. I, these are some common statements. If you listen to other, uh, maybe presentations somewhere else, be it be at uh, UVM, sometimes I go to UVM to uh, do uh, guest presentations or in uh, public forums. I never stop saying that I'm so proud of being this country. You know, this is the first country I have with uh, you know my citizenship. You know, I don't want yeah. to go away. Yes. So time and again, I thought myself, you know, with a lot of things going in the United States. Uh, we lived in the country where we were born. Um, we were disowned by the country and I had to go to refugee camps uh, without, you know, without their country, uh, uh, separated from the family members and friends. And then 
that was not our home in the refugee camps. We knew that that was not the home that we were right. going to have it called Grow the Kids. And we happen to be in the U.S. through U.S. Uh, Refugee Resettlement Program. We are in this country. As we came in here, this is a great country, but there are a lot of problems, issues with regard to, um, you know, racial discriminations and so many other uh, political issues mm -hmm. related with so many group of people. Uh, sometimes I feel, you know, I have a citizen, I have a passport, I have the license to live in this country. Um, will this be a repeated cyclic story that, you know, because you were born in the country, you were disowned by your own country, and then now you are adopting another country. Mm -hmm. It constantly keep, in, keep me in thinking, are my kids or me going to stay here forever? Mm -hmm. Though, as I said, I have the equal sense of loyalty to this country and love to this country. Yes. You know, that's a big question behind how it mm -hmm. goes. I just have to watch for it. That's and right. in addition to that, Gary, you know, I always wanted to become the army officer back in the country when I was in, in Bhutan. Mm -hmm. And then I thought about after I graduated, from UVM, I thought about how can I be a contributor to this, to this great nation? I thought about, oh, well, in my schools in my country, I wanted to become an army officer. Is there a way that I can become here? Um, I try to go through the websites for uh, Brahman National Guard. Mm -hmm. I think I'm too old to become the National Guard. <laughs> so that's a sense. That's a yeah. sense. Yeah. Well, you know, I, and I'll say this in a, a parting way that, you know, America in many ways is a young country. And unlike Bhutan, where you were asked to leave because you spoke out with a peaceful demonstration, this country needs people to speak out to help shape its future. And I really think that your family, yourself and others, um, by contributing your thoughts and ideas and inspirations, will help make us the country that we can be. You know, we talk about creating the perfect union and we're not there yet, but we're walking towards that. And to have you and your family be a part of that conversation will help us. And I hope you um, consider continuing to do that and staying here because we, we need you. Sure, Gary, um, uh, towards the end, um, I personally and my family personally thank this great country, uh, all the American people um, who felt, you know, giving a life, another life for refugees in this country with a great feeling and affections. Uh, I should thank for them and all those uh, who were involved in bringing refugees here and giving a life. I think it's, it's not a bad idea. It is one of the noble services that America can give it for someone who lived in refugee camps, especially those kids without educations. You know, we are a leader as a nation and we should continue uh, to help the people around the world, including refugee resettlement programs. You know. Absolutely. I'm, I'm so much happy that, uh, that I always feel that I have a lot of, lot of uh, you know, debt that I need to give it to this country. You know. So I'm in the process of giving back um, to whatever way I am, because uh, I involve in my city city activities in the city of Burlington. Uh, I try to work beyond my um, beyond my scheduled work. You know, try to help the people. So some ways I'm looking for more greater platform, but not a politics, but a greater platform in which I can serve better, you know? mm -hmm. serve better for the American people. Thank you, Gary, for inviting You're me. You're welcome. Thank you. And uh, it's been nice spending time with you, Lamont.